Good evening. What a wonderful prelude. Thank you very much. This music is definitely psychoactive. Dr. Kendall, dear Eric, Dr. Kendall, dear Denise, dear colleagues, dear guests, according to the Mayan calendar, this is our last evening. It's wonderful that we can spend it together. I'm extremely happy and honored that we have one of the pioneers of modern neuroscience uh, in Basel today. Over several decades, Dr. Kendall made groundbreaking discoveries regarding the molecular mechanisms of learning and memory, and this work led to the Nobel Prize in the year 2000. And as you will hear in the Laudatio by Andreas Papasotropoulos, Dr. Kendall's discoveries are also of great importance for our research activities here in Basel, and we are therefore delighted to present him um, with the honorary doctorate. Of course, this doesn't compare to the Nobel Prize, but receiving an honorary doctorate on the last day before the end of the world isn't bad either. <laughs> Tonight, Dr. Kendall will talk about animal uh, models of mental illness, the cognitive and negative uh, symptoms of schizophrenia. Also, this topic um, is of great importance for Basel as we have an initiative aimed at combining molecular and animal and human genetic studies at and translating the findings also into clinical conditions. Besides research, Dr. Kendall is also well known for another reason. There is probably not a single psychology student in the room uh, who does not know one of the excellent textbooks written by Dr. Kendall. If there's one, please raise your hand now. Uh, and believe me, these books are not only a great help for the students, but also for the professors. However, Dr. Kendall does not only write textbooks, but very recently also a, a book on the age of insight, the quest to understand the unconscious in art, mind, and brain from Vienna 1900 to the present. An excellent book. I can highly recommend it. So you might wonder, how is it possible to be so productive? And what do you have to do to get a Nobel Prize? According um, to a recently published paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, the answer might be chocolate. Um, Swiss chocolate. So this study, uh, which by the way is not a hoax, showed that there is a highly significant correlation between the amount of chocolate consumption and the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million population. So if you look here, oh, this one. <laughs> so if you look here, uh, you see low number of laureates, low chocolate consumption, like China or Greece, sorry Andreas, <laughs> goes up, and here you see Switzerland. But of course, uh, correlation does not mean causation, and therefore I would like to propose to you, Eric, to find out if there is a chocolate receptor in the ma uh, molecular machinery of memory that could explain these results. Before I welcome now Andreas Papasotiropoulos for the Laudatio, I would like to thank my assistant, Melanie Knabe, um, who helped organizing this event, and I would like to thank uh, the Baroque Orchestra La Cetra uh, for playing for us so nicely tonight. And um, yeah, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Dear Eric, dear Denise, dear colleagues, dear guests, one might erroneously postulate that preparing a laudation for someone like Eric Kandel is an easy one. So much is known and published about him, his life, his personal and academic achievements, his interests and hobbies, his prizes, that gathering the readily available data 
And coming up with a ready-to-go speech may look like a 10-minute task. However, this is exactly the point, which turns a laudation into a non-everyday, non-trivial task. So much is known about him. Everybody knows that Dr. Kandel, a psychiatrist, revolutionized neuroscience with his pioneering and inspiring discoveries related to the molecular mechanisms of learning and memory. Everybody knows that Dr. Kandel's life story is tightly linked to the history of two continents, to the barbaric atrocities in the old continent and to the spirit of hope and freedom, both personal and academic, in the new one. Everybody knows that Dr. Kandel's dedication and passion for, for research is truly limitless. Everybody knows that Dr. Kandel is professor at Columbia University and senior investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, just to name some of his affiliations. Everybody knows that Dr. Kandel has been awarded the Order pour le Mérite für Wissenschaften und Künste. Everybody knows that Dr. Kandel is Nobel Prize laureate. However, that only few people know are the reasons why the Faculty of Psychology of the University of Basel decided to confer the privileges of an honorary doctorate in psychology upon Eric Kandel. Let me highlight to you two of the reasons why. There are many more. Firstly, dear Eric, you are the reason why undergraduates in psychology at the University of Basel learn very early that ignoring the brain's molecular machinery when studying its outputs, for example, emotions and behavior, is really a bad idea. Students of psychology have to learn and to prove that they understood following quote, which might sound familiar to you. I first became interested in the study of memory in 1950 as a result of, as a result of my readings in psychoanalysis while still an undergraduate at Harvard College. Later, during medical training, I found the psychoanalytic approach limiting because it tended to treat the brain, the organ that generates behavior, as a black box. I began to appreciate that during my generation, the black box of the brain would be opened and that problems of memory storage, once the exclusive domains of psych psychologists and psychoanalysts, could be investigated with the methods of modern biology. It's this, it's your quote, Eric, which is engraved now in the hippocampi of the students of molecular psychology at our university. Secondly, your way of thinking and performing research, as well as your vision, inspired, and still inspires, both research and teaching at our faculty and university. Your transdisciplinary, transfaculty approach, your psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, biologist, neuroscientist, gave rise to transdisciplinary, transfaculty research here in Basel by officially linking psychology to medicine and to the Biocentrum. Molecular cascades of learning and memory described by you are being studied in humans by means of large-scale human genetic and brain imaging studies here while we speak. So, it is fair to ask, who is really honored by this honorary doctorate? It's us, dear Eric, who are deeply honored by your presence today. We are deeply thankful for your inspiration and are truly looking forward to your talk, Mice, Men and Mental Illness, a transgenic mouse model of the cognitive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Dominic. I'm delighted to be here today uh, to describe to you recent studies that have been carrying out on mice, men, and mental illness, a transgenic mouse model of cognitive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Before I get into that, I just want to point out uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be here and how grateful I am to the University of Basel, not only for inviting me, but being so very generous in the way they handled this invitation. I love Basel. Uh, first of all, as was just pointed out to me, unlike the United States that goes to war at every single opportunity, Switzerland has not gone to war for 400,000 years. <laughs> 
And therefore, Basel is as intact today. It is, was you know, 400 years ago, and the old town of Basel is simply magnificent. Moreover, Denise and I like art, and the museums you have here, and you have not one, but you have several absolutely outstanding museums, are just wonderful. So we went to the Kunstmuseum yesterday, and we saw for the fifth time uh, Koschka's, uh, the uh, Alma Mahler and Kokoschka in the Kokishan Jack, you know, this wonderful painting of the two of them at sea. Um, we went, then went to the Bailey Museum and we saw the special Degas exhibition. We just had an absolutely wonderful time. Not to speak of the science, as you will see, the thinking here at the University of Basel bringing together genetics and cognitive psychology of memory and now mental disorders, very much parallel my own, and the three of us have been talking for a very long period of time. And as you will see as I discuss the ideas that we've been developing in my lab, they bear enormous parallel to those that you're exposed to here uh, in Basel. Let me put this in a little bit of a background, but you already uh, heard about this uh, a little bit uh, from uh, Andreas. Um, I began with an interest in psychoanalysis. I went to medical school with the whole idea of becoming a psychoanalyst. Um, in the senior year of medical school, um, having no great interest in science, but having a great interest and, and passion for patient care, I thought that even a psychoanalyst should know something about the brain. So I took an elective uh, in brain science at Columbia and I just absolutely loved them working in the lab. I never had experience like this before. And I won't forget, I was dating Denise and I took her out and I said, you know, Denise, I could see doing this for a living, uh, but it's silly. We, I can't afford this. You don't have any money and I don't have any money. We want to get married, we want to raise children and I've got to go into private practice. And she said, absurd, money is of no importance. Those magic words she has not muttered again once in our 57 years of marriage. <laughs> anyway, I had a wonderful time in that elective, and uh, as a result of that, I was recommended to the NIH. So even before I began my residency training in psychiatry, which I later took, I had three years' experience um, in basic science, and I became interested in memory. I started off working on the hippocampus. I decided that that was too complicated to begin to work on. This was 1957. And I began to look for a simple system in which to study learning and memory. And I turned to the snail. And I studied that for many years. And then ultimately, when genetics of mice came along, I added mice to our laboratory's repertoire. And I now study in parallel uh, a memory storage in snails and in mice, and now beginning to study disorders of memory. And how did I turn to this? How, at this particular point in my life, after having avoided problems of mental illness for so long, uh, did I decide to turn to it? And that is, I was once asked to review how come there's been such enormous progress as a result of molecular biology in the study of neurological diseases and such limited progress in the studying of psychiatric diseases? In the course of writing that review, I thought a lot about it, and I came to the conclusion that there are really a number of reasons why neurology is so advanced in using molecular approaches. To begin with, we know a great deal about the anatomical basis of most neurological disorders. Uh, we've known, for example, that Parkinson's disease uh, involves the basal ganglia. We've known that Hunting's disease involves the caudate nucleus, that amyotrophic lateral sclerosis involves the motor neurons. Three different disorders of motor systems involve different stages in the motor pathway. A number of neurological diseases are genetically straightforward, they've been well characterized, they're caused by a single gene, you can clone that gene, sequence it, you can then uh, put that gene into worms, into flies, into mice, and create animal models of these diseases, and that allows you to study mechanism of pathogenesis, how this gene does its harm, how does it produce the disease. Those four features which are ingrained in the fabric of neurology are by and large missing in psychiatry, at least were until very recently. 
We know very little about the neuroanatomical base of most mental illness. This is still largely true today, although we're beginning to learn something about it. Um, mental illnesses are genetically complex, and we're going to come to one of the reasons they're so complex. They involve a number of genes. We know very little about specific genes involved in these major mental illnesses, and we have a difficult time producing animal models of these disorders. So the question is, how can one develop a mouse model of something as complicated as schizophrenia? And I'd like to suggest to you, and this is something I share in common with the Basler group, that these disorders, as they're clinically defined, are too complex. One needs to take a component of these disorders and study it in great detail. And if possible, to define a legitimate subcomponent of the disorder, <clears throat> an endophenotype. This is by no means a new idea. This has been traditional in aspects of medicine. Simply to remind you that Brown and Goldstein's great contribution to the understanding of atherosclerosis was not to study atherosclerosis by itself, but to study cholesterol metabolism as one key step to atherosclerosis. And this led him to the study of LDL receptors and open up the modern understanding of atherosclerosis. So how does one go about this? So together with uh, three colleagues, to begin with, I began with Eleanor Simpson and Christoph Kellendorg. Eleanor is still working on this problem with me. And recently, we've had the collaboration of Ryan Ward, a very good cognitive psychologist. <clears throat> and we argued in the following way. If you want to look at, for an endophenotype, Let's look at the symptom clusters of schizophrenia. Now, as you know, schizophrenia is characterized by positive, negative, and cognitive symptoms. The positive symptoms are the craziness, the disordered thought, the hallucinations, the delusions. The negative symptoms are social withdrawal, blunted affect, decreased motivation, and the cognitive symptoms are attentional deficits, deficits in working memory, deficits in executive function, deficits in organizing one's life. The positive symptoms, hallucinations and delusions, are difficult to study in a mouse. How would you know whether a mouse is deluded with its having hallucination? Even mouse lovers like myself have a difficult time recognizing this. But the negative symptoms, the social withdrawal, the blunted, the decreased motivation, and the cognitive defects, working memory, attentional defects, these can be studied. And I want to show you a series of studies in which we've tried to define first the cognitive and then the negative symptoms. Moreover, these are interesting from other points of view. Antipsychotic drugs, which have been in use in the treatment of schizophrenia since the late 1950s, are quite effective in treating the positive symptoms. They help the psychosis, uh, they help the hallucinations and delusions, but they don't significantly affect the negative and cognitive symptoms. Uh, these the person carries with them for the rest of their life. And this is why it's such a terribly debilitating and lifelong illness. Um, they're highly predictive. The severity of the illness, of, of these symptoms, highly predictive of long-term progress. And there is a sense, and I will provide some evidence for it, that they're correlated with each other much more than they're correlated with the positive symptoms. There is a feeling that the negative symptoms contribute to the cognitive symptoms. The decreased motivation also decreases the attentional deficit, the deficit in working memory, deficit in executive function. So I'm going to outline a series sort of for five steps that I want to cover in my talk. I want to give you a background to a mouse model we created. I want to speak about the cognitive symptoms, the negative symptoms, potential mechanisms for some of these, and novel treatment strategies. Let me begin with the first, the <clears throat> background to a mouse. Um, our molecular approach is to focus on the dopamine D2 receptor. And that's for several reasons. One, all effective antipsychotic drugs antagonize the D2 receptor. There's an increase in dopamine release in estradium in patients with schizophrenia. That's been documented in almost every patient that has been imaged. This is due to a number of different reasons. But one reason is there's an increased occupancy and density of D2 receptors in the stratum of schizophrenia. And in a minority of cases, there's a polymorphism in the D2 receptor gene that I'll tell you about in a moment that is associated with an increased risk for schizophrenia and an increased D2 receptor ligand binding as well as poor performance in some cognitive working memory tasks. So to see whether there's merit in developing a mouse based upon this idea, we first did a genetic test. 
very much like it's being carried out here in Basel. In fact, we were very much influenced by the Basel tradition. We argued as follows. If you take the D2 receptor, there is an allelic polymorphism. As you know, for every gene that you have in your genome, there are in the population at large a lot of allelic variations. Most of these are neutral. They don't have much of a significance. Some of them are mutations, and they can either be beneficial and protective or detrimental. The ancestral gene has in this sequence a thymidine, whereby an allelic polymorphism has a cytidine. This doesn't in any way affect the protein that is produced, but the messenger RNA that has the cytidine is more stable. So it hangs around longer and has the effect of increasing the amount of D2 receptor that is inserted in uh, neurons, in the striatal neurons that uh, they express the D2 receptor. So we thought this allelic polymorphism is associated with schizophrenia, but it also exists in people who don't have schizophrenia. They might be remote relatives of people that have it, but they themselves have absolutely no symptoms about it. So we thought we would compare just people in the wild, if you will, people without any symptoms of schizophrenia, that differ in having a C to G conversion in this particular position, and test them for working memory tasks. And what we did was we took healthy individuals that either had um, two copies of this, that is, that increased stability uh, of the messenger RNA, leading to increased D2 receptor expression, uh, versus people that only had one copy or no copies of it, that either had two Ts or one T and one C. And this is the control population that had either two copies of T or one copy of C and T, versus those that had two copies, that is, at each of the two uh, alleles that had a copy of the cytidine. And we gave them a six-word serial position task, which you not only have to remember six words, but you have to know the sequence in which the words occurred. And typically, when you give people a list like this, there's something called a recency primacy effect. You remember the first word and the last word best, and you have the most difficulty with words in between. And that was true for this list as well. But if you see, for all of these intermediate words, the people that had two versions of the C allele that give you an increased stability, therefore increased D2 receptor expression, did worse than those who had only one copy or no copies of this. So this tells you that this really contributes even to people who don't have schizophrenia to working memory. Now the increase in D2 receptor functioning in the stratum need not only occur as a result of D2 overexpression per se, D2 receptor expression, it can occur with increased transmitter release and increased dopamine synthesis. So either synthesis, release, or receptor expression can cause the same phenotype, overactivity of dopamine release, overactivity of D2 receptor occupancy. So we decided we would express, we would generate a mouse that would have the following characteristics. It would have a D2 receptor overexpression, quantitatively similar that you see in humans with schizophrenia, number one. Number two, only expressed in the striatum, because that's where the increase in dopamine is evident, the increase in dopamine release and dopamine function. And two, we would generate it in a way that you could turn the gene on and off at will. So when we work, began to work in uh, genetically modified mice, Mark Mayford in my lab developed new methodologies for doing this. And he developed two methodologies, one that restricted the expression of the gene, and two that allowed you to turn the gene on and off. And the way he did this <clears throat> is he developed a transgene that was driven by the CAM kinase promoter. The CAM kinase promoter is limited to the forebrain. So if you express this transgene, it only expresses in the forebrain. <clears throat> if you generate a number of different lines, you will find some lines that are specific to only parts of the forebrain. This is just by chance alone. And you will invariably, if you generate five to 10 strains, get some that are specific to the stratum. And I will show you that. We took this promoter and we hooked it up to a tetracycline activator. This is a gene that produces a transcription factor that is specific to bacteria. It is not recognized by any vertebrate mammalian uh, promoter. 
So we put this promoter that recognizes the tetracycline in bacteria, and we hooked it up to the D2 receptor expression. So you now generate two lines of mice. Each of them has one of the transgenes, and you mate them so the two of them are together. And that mated one, the uh, TT trans activator, the transcription factor, is made, and it binds to the TED-O promoter to activate the D2 expressor, and the gene can be turned on. Turns out that this transcription activator is sensitive to tetracycline. So if you give this drug, you can give it orally, you can inject it. It binds to this transcription factor, causes it to undergo a conformational change and to pop off the promoter. And that turns the gene off. So you can have the gene on, you can have the gene off at will, okay? So with this, we began to explore how this particular transgene affects working memory. Before we did this, we wanted to see how much is the gene affected. And when we turned the gene on, we saw there was about a 15% increase in the expression of D2 receptors in Australia. When we turned the gene off, it returned to normal. That 15% is in the, in the range. Humans have about 11 to 12%. So it was not a massive overexpression, very similar to what we see in people. So we use this to first model the cognitive symptoms. Now, the, one of the wonderful things, and I think it's important that you become familiar with this idea, is <clears throat> that mice are really human beings writ small with a lot more fur than we have. That is, even though they're much simpler than we are, <clears throat> you can adopt many of the tests that have been used in people for cognitive performance and use them in the, in, the, in the mouse. I will not take you through all of them, but there are a number of working memory tasks, for example, spatial working memory, which we can easily modify from human tasks to the mouse. And I will give you one example of that. We use an acquisition, a delayed non-matched sample of a, a t-test that requires the medial prefrontal cortex in mice. And the way this is run is you have a t-maze and you block off one arm you put the mouse here. The mouse only has one choice. It has, can only go to the left, and that's where it gets a reinforcer, a pellet. You now give it a four-second delay, and it runs the maze again, this time with the arm removed. So it has to remember if it wants a reinforcement, and mice like reinforcement, that going to the left is a waste of time. It's got to go right. So it's got to remember that the last time it went for a reinforcement, it got it on the left, the only way it'll get a reinforcer is to go to the right. And with time, animals do very well with that. But if you lesion the prefrontal cortex, they are compromised in the ability to, come to do this task. So with this as a background, we went on and explored this in the genetically modified mouse that overexpresses the D2 receptor. And you see this is the wild type, and this is the D2 overexpressing mouse. We now turn the gene off, and lo and behold, there was absolutely no change. This is the wild type, and this is the D2 overexpressing mouse. Now, this is amazing. I've turned the gene off. The gene is, as far as we can tell, completely turned off, but you have exactly the same uh, defect than you had before. Well, maybe it's because early, in, you know, in postnatal development, when they're learning, acquiring language, motor skill, whatever mice develop in the early days, maybe this is when it's essential to have it. So let's turn off the gene at birth. We turn off the gene at birth, <clears throat> and you see that D2 overexpression still has exactly the same phenotype, even though the gene is for the first time turned off immediately when the animal is born. What does that mean? That tells you why giving a D2 receptor blockade to an adult person, even age 13 or 14, is not effective. Because blocking the D2 receptor at that point doesn't accomplish a darn thing. We've seen that even if you turn it off at birth, it doesn't accomplish a damn thing. <clears throat> it tells you that some change, some compensation must have occurred during development, that the D2 overexpression 
during development affect some other metabolic pathway, some other genetic pathway, and that pathway carries on even after you've turned off the D2 receptor. And it provides support, some of the earliest genetic support, for schizophrenia as a developmental disorder, which has been an idea that's been around for some time. It also tells you that the striatum has a larger impact in cognitive function than we had previously assumed. So we wanted what is being compensated for? What are the steps involved in a compensatory process? <clears throat> now, we'd known from Pat Goldman Wakich's work that very important for working memory in the prefrontal cortex is the D1 receptor, the adenosyclase coupled receptor. And it's very, very sensitive in its function. It only optimizes working memory in an appropriate range of expression. If there's too little D2 receptor expressed or too much, it interferes with working memory. It's very delicately poised at the middle level to give you optimal level of expression. So we began to look at what happens when the D2 re receptor in the, uh, in the stratum is overexpressed. What happens to the D1 receptor? And we see that, in fact, D1 receptor is overactive. It is more active than usual, so it's this particular part of the curve. When we turned the gene off, we found to our surprise that it is suppressed. So here it is overactive, and here it is underactive. So in each case, we move it away from this inverted U-shaped function, which is characteristic of optimal working memory. And we showed this in a number of ways by actually uh, measuring increased uh, dopamine exp in the, in the uh, prefrontal cortex, and we monitored the amount of dopamine release. <clears throat> um, so how does the D2 overexpression alter cortical uh, dopamine? I'm going to come to this later on when I speak about the mechanisms involved. So the next step is we looked at negative symptoms. The negative symptoms consist of social withdrawal, decreased motivation, and blunted affect. I'm going to take them up in turn. I'll first turn to social withdrawal. It's actually quite easy to study in mice. Mice tend to be very social, and one way to do it is to arouse their sexuality. This is unusual by people. Their social so sociability is not at all affected by sex. <laughs> um, and the way you do this is you take a male, D2 transgenic mice, uh, and you put them together for five minutes with an unfamiliar female. You take male mice, you put them together with a female that's been overectomized, and you measure the amount of time they spend together. Now, wild type mice love to nuzzle close to females, but the mutant mice are deficient in that. They're deficient with the gene on, and they're deficient with the gene off. So this is similar to what I showed you before. There's a clear deficit in social interaction, and that social interaction is somehow compensated for by when the gene is turned off because something happened during development. What about decreased motivation? This is a terrible part of the disease. This is what prevents people with schizophrenia from organizing their life, from getting back to work, from doing things that are important to them. <clears throat> So it has several components to it. Willingness to work toward the outcome. This is deficient in patients with schizophrenia. <clears throat> the ability to anticipate the outcome, which is deficient in patients with schizophrenia. And hedonic or pleasurable qualities of an outcome is liking. And this is normal in patients with schizophrenia. Now this is so fascinating that I want to explain it to you in some detail. If you tell somebody in Basel who has schizophrenia, uh, Hans, uh, why did you come to dinner with me tonight at La Trois Rois? The Three Kings. I don't know whether you've been to that. It's a marvelous restaurant. This is where the university put the knees in me up. We couldn't ask. We, you know, we love to go to La Benedan, which is considered New York's best restaurant, and we decided this is even better. <laughs> and you ask Hans, Hans, why don't you come to me, with me, to dinner there? And he'll say, oh, 
It's such a schlep to go so far. I don't want to do it. I would have to take a taxi or subway. It's too much work. They have no interest in doing it. No matter how much you talk, you cannot talk them into it. You tell them how wonderful the service is, how wonderful the food is, and the wine. They even serve Italian wines if you want Italian wines. Barolas. Walter Gehrig is a fanatic about Verola, explains his intellectual functioning, which is so extraordinary. Italian wines, it's not chocolate, it's Italian wines that doesn't. Uh, but if you take him there and you sit him down, he will enjoy the meal as much as you and me. It's a paradoxical phenomenon, but absolutely true for schizophrenics. And I should tell you in advance that I presented this talk recently at Johns Hopkins, and a man came up to me and said, you know, your mouse functions just like my son does. So let me show you how this mouse functions. The first thing we asked is whether the mouse is willing to work for an outcome. And the way you do this, if you give the animal a reward, he presses a button, a, a lever, and he gets a reward, and you increase the number of bar presses he has to carry out in order to get the award. So first he gets it with two presses, then with four, then with eight, then with 16. After a while, everybody, even undergraduates at the University of Basel, which have endless energy, will drop out. But needless to say, this is a control mouse. This is a mouse with D2 overexpression. It drops out earlier. If you now turn off the gene, amazingly, this recovers. So this shows you that some of the consequences of D2 overexpression is irreversible, and some are reversible, okay? But irreversible means that some compensation has occurred that even after you turn the gene off, it persists. And here, some compensation has occurred, but when you turn the gene off, the compensation also reverses. So there are a number of things that could, you could give you a wrong result on this. They could satiate sooner, they could fatigue sooner, they're less tolerant, waiting for reward, they're less tolerant for non-rewarding stimuli. We examined all of these, and none of them had any relevance to this. So we wanted to say, maybe the reason that the D2 overexpressing mice don't work so hard for the food is they're not hungry. They've just had a big meal. Maybe they went to the Three Kings, and they had a wonderful meal there. They don't want another meal. So uh, we gave them a choice. We gave them a choice between uh, two kinds of food. We gave them evaporated milk, which is the uh, equivalent to a mouse of a milkshake or a Barola wine. Uh, or we gave them the regular chow. This is just boring stuff that they eat all the time. To, get, to eat this all the time, they have to do nothing. They can just go over and lick it or grab it. In order to get the really delicious stuff, they have to work a little bit. So we want to see, is it because, you know, they're not hungry, they've had a meal just before, or is it because they don't want to work? The fact is, they practically never press the bar because they don't want to work, but they eat this junk because it's readily available. So it's not that they're not hungry, they're as hungry as you and me, they just don't want to work for food. <clears throat> and you see again that this is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the wild type mouse, and this is the uh, mutant mouse, this is with the delicious stuff, and this is with the junk. So they eat much more of the junk than of the delicious stuff because they simply don't want to work. And both of these things are reversed when you turn off the D2 overexpressing mouse. <clears throat> now, um, why are they less willing to work? Well, one is they could require, uh, uh, they, they don't do a cost-benefit calculation, they, they, and they don't have that capability. The reward first must be valued. You have to sense that this is a positive, pleasurable thing, and you want to work for it. And the value of the reward must be accurately represented. And maybe they have difficulty with this. So we began by asking them whether or not uh, they, they like this stuff. Uh, and we measured the number of times that they lick, and they licked wild type did as much as the mutant mice, so they, they do really like it. Moreover, we could actually test their facial expression. The amazing thing is, and Darwin first pointed this out, uh, that the liking response is universal. Uh, both the pleasurable and the aversive response are amazingly maintained. If you look at babies and you look at mice, for both aversion and hedonic reaction, they're very, very similar. For positive things, the mice lick their lips 
just like you and I do, perversive thing, they shy away from it. So we hired a group of undergraduates, we put them underneath the platform where the mice came to get this food, and they blindly, without knowing anything, marked this, and they showed that, in fact, they were exactly the same, exactly the same with and without the gene. So they had a perfectly good hedonic reaction. Uh, so the question is, are they accurately able to represent the reward value? <clears throat> and for this, they have to do a more difficult task. Uh, they have two levers. One, they would get rewarded every 20 seconds, so they have to press it very infrequently. They can be lazy, but they only get very little reward. And the other is they I'm sorry, they get reward every 20 seconds, they get it fairly frequently, and the others, they get it only 120 seconds, so they can afford to press it more slowly, but they get much, much less in result. Moreover, we switch this, so we first give them one lever on the left and the other on the right, and then we change it so they get it on the other, so they don't just learn the position of the lever. And as you might guess, they don't like to do this because it involves a lot of work. Even though they would get much more reinforcement, get much more pleasure, they take the easy way out. And this shows you again control versus D2 overexpression. So let me simply summarize the motivational deficits. They're less willing to work for the preferred outcome. The hedonic reaction is attacked and they're less able to accurately represent the value of the future outcome. So this is very much as I told you before. When they actually get there, they enjoy it. They just don't want to put in the effort to do it, and they can't predict how pleasurable it's going to be. And this is exactly like you have, this is data from humans. They have, uh, the consumatory response is identical. Once they get to a wonderful restaurant, they enjoy it, but anticipatory one is absolutely lousy. This is schizophrenic. This is non-schizophrenic people, con the consumatory response is identical. We obviously want to explore the potential mechanisms, and we've begun to do that. So we want to ask, what's happening to the dopaminergic neurons? How does striatal D2 overexpression alter cortical dopamine cognition anticipatory ma motivation? How does it affect the firing pattern of dopaminergic neuron in the ventral tegmental area? Simply to remind you, there are two clusters of dopaminergic neuron, one in the substantia nigra, which goes to the dorsal striatum, and the other, which goes uh, to the uh, uh, ventral tegmental, goes from the ventral tegmental area uh, to the nucleus accumbens and uh, to the uh, prefrontal cortex. Nucleus accumbens is uh, also part of the striatum. And we did uh, in vivo electrophysiology, together with Joachim uh, Ropa, in which we identified with backfilling VTA neurons that projected to the medial prefrontal cortex. So we knew we were recording, we used markers, we were recording from the VTA, we were recording from dopaminergic neurons, and we knew they were recording that they were going to the medial prefrontal cortex. We also recorded from cells in the substantia nigra as controls. Uh, and we first recorded from the ventral tegmental area, and we found the characteristic firing pattern that's described there. Uh, and that is that these cells fire rapidly, but they also fire in bursts. So, so if you look at a long scale firing, you see these bursts, but you also see uh, increased firing, and it shows you both of that. Uh, if you now turn the gene on, in the overexpressing mouse is the wild type, you see that the firing rate is slowed and the bursting is essentially wiped out. The in vivo firing reduction is specific to the VTA. You don't see it in the, in the substantia nigra. So this is an, a, a, a decrease in firing rate that you see in the, the uh, VTA. You don't see this decreased firing rate in the substantia nigra. Um, and the burstiness is also selectively reduced uh, only in the VTA uh, you, in, with, the, with the gene overexpression. Uh, you don't see it uh, uh, in, uh, in the dorsal striatum. Um, if you now switch the gene off, the reduced firing rate is rescued uh, by take, taking the trans gene off, okay? Um, while it, it's not rescued, it, well, in the, you, you see this has no effect at all in the substantia nigra, but in VTA it rescues the reduction in the firing rate. But if you look at the bursting rate, turning the gene off has no effect. So turning the gene off 
reverses the defect of firing rate, but not of burstiness. What is the behavioral significance of this? I showed you before that the cognitive deficit is persistent. So this is consistent with it being related um, to the fact of the bursting, which is persistent, it is not reversed, while the reduced incentive motivation is reversible, in principle, might be correlated with the regular firing. Um, and in fact, this is what we, I showed you, the burstiness is persistent. Even after you turn the transgene off, the burstiness persists, uh, 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 but the firing frequency is reversible. In fact, earlier studies have shown that when you look at mice while they learn, the phasic D, uh, dopamine release is required for learning, and uh, the tonic f is, uh, is required for the motivational state. And this is what's reversed, and this cognitive defect, which I showed you at the beginning, the prefrontal cortical defect, is not reversed. And we're now doing measurements of various kinds, microanalysis and voltometry, in order to check this out, and so far data is completely consistent with this view. So let me end up with how do these mouse models help you in developing new treatment strategies. So we focused on the deficit incentive motivation uh, in the D2 overexpressing mice because this is reversible and therefore potentially treatable in adults. As I showed you, the motivational defect is extremely important uh, and it is reversible. So we wondered whether you can use a mouse model to generate uh, ideas about the drug and identify potential therapeutic targets. And the first thing we did is to carry out uh, a gene chip analysis to analyze changes that might underlie the motivational deficit. And we analyzed 23,000 transcripts from the striatal tissue of D2 overexpressing mice with and without docs. So we wanted to see things that were turned on in one case and turned off in the other, okay? So we identified a number of genes that were up and down regulated permanently or only doing the expression of the transgene in concurrent with the motion motivational deficit. And we found a number of genes that were changed, but we were particularly struck with the fact that a number of serotonin receptor gene expression in the stratum of the mouse was changed. And one of them was changed particularly dramatically, which is a 5-HT2C receptor. So this is simply to show you the change in that receptor. This is with the gene on. You see an increase in the expression of the receptor. This is messenger on A level. This is the protein level. And if you turn the gene off, you re reverse this uh, receptor level, both in the message and the protein, back to normal. <clears throat> so we wanted to see uh, what happens if you now test this in... Uh, the mice. Uh, will the animal work hard for a reward? And you give this a, a uh, same task that I gave you before. This is the control. This is the mutant mice with the D2 overexpressing mouse. And you see the defect that I showed you before. But there is available on the market a blocker of this serotonin receptor that was developed by Smith Klein Beecham, SB242084. And when we gave this to the mouse, it reversed this defect. So it went from here to here. We essentially cured the mouse. And we wondered what happens if we give this to the wild type mice. We found that even the wild type improved. What does this mean? First of all, we gave it to ourselves. Something that is so good for wild types should not, people shouldn't be deprived from that, number one. And it made one realize that it's possible that this is a general increase in motivation, and it might be useful in other disorders as well. It might be increased in, uh, useful in the, in the defect in motivation that you see in certain depressed patients. So let me summarize what I've said so far. The cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia represent a developmental order they can result from an excessive D2 receptor activation in the stratum. The reason D2 receptors do not reverse these symptoms is because overexpression of D2 receptors leads to compensatory changes in the prefrontal cortex. The cognitive and negative impairments are affected by a common cause. Excess D2 receptor activation and compensatory changes, specifically in D1 receptors, which cannot be reversed, by giving a T2 receptor blocker, and by 5-HT2C receptor functioning, which I showed you, can be reversed. 
This suggests that the cognitive neg negative symptoms may share a common component. This is not a novel idea. Clinicians have suggested this before. But it points out that a single gene abnormality restricted to a single brain area can lead to compensatory changes that are spatially widespread, could be very difficult to interpret, yet may be restricted in terms of molecular nature to targets of compensation, in this case, D1 receptor and 5-HT2C uh, uh, receptors. And it makes a point that the several have been, have been discussing uh, for, for the last several days, uh, and that is uh, uh, Dominic, Andreas, and myself, and that is that one needs to look at multiple targets in treating a complex disorder like schizophrenia. Uh, even for a single endophenotype, one may have more than one target, but certainly since there are different endophenotypes, as it clearly here, using a number of different drugs may be absolutely essential, and one should think more in terms of developing drugs for the endophenotype than for the disease as a whole. I also want to make the point that although mice obviously are not human beings, certain aspects of the disorder can be studied very effectively in mice, and they not only give you insight into the pathophysiological mechanisms, but they can also be used to t test new pharmacological therapies. Um, but can one go further? Cognitive psychology has utilized powerful methods, including neuroimaging, for isolating and describing the functional properties of behavioral and cognitive regulatory mechanisms. And biology has recreated, developed powerful methods, including genetically modified mice, for, as, for analysis of neural mechanism at multiple levels. I should point out that one of the greatnesses of the efforts here in Basel is cognitive psychology and molecular genetics are so effectively fused. But psychiatry is at a bit of a standstill. We really haven't made uh, significant advances either in understanding or treating mental illness in the last several decades. And this is evident by the fact that major pharmaceutical companies are moving out of mental illnesses. They've invested a lot of money, often by repeating the same kind of paradigms in different contexts, and they have not made much progress with it. So we need a new paradigm shift, and we need to be able to sort of focus on the endophenotypes, the, symptom, the very simple uh, symptom complex that make this up. And I think advances in combining behavioral and cognitive phenotypes um, and f using them as a focus is likely to g identify the biological substratums and give you new approaches to treatment. And one thing we've tried to do is to try to uh, uh, modify the behavioral approaches that we use by not only trying to develop improved paradigms for mice, but to try to develop paradigms in people that match those that we're using in mice. So you're using a parallel paradigm to study the same problem in people and in mice. So we started this with Ed Smith and Peter Balsam, and we're continuing this. Essentially, what, uh, what Ed Smith and Peter Balsam did is, in the paradigm that I'm talking about, looking at human motivation, they developed a reward for effort paradigm in humans using fMRI to study this that bore parallels to uh, the uh, paradigm that we were using in the mouse. So they varied the amount of effort required for each reward as we were doing, and the palatability of the reward as we were doing, uh, in order to measure the anticipatory hedonia effort calculation and the consumatory hedonia in both species using the same principles. And they worked this out in some detail. And what it ideally would like, like us to do is, which I would suggest is a step in the right direction, integration of psychiatry, neurobiology, and cognitive psychology is the following. One begins with the patient, of course, as one always begins. One has a phenomenological, behavioral, cognitive symptoms of the patient. One then does imaging, and one gets some insights from that, and also genetic analysis to give you a clue as to the genes involved, okay? From that, you generate a mouse. The mouse, again, one can study behavioral and cognitive imaging ideas there in the mouse, analyze the neural circuits, molecular targets, identify the genes, and get insight from that not only into people, but this feeds back to allow you to develop progressively more insight into the nature of the mouse, improve the mo mouse model in addition to getting insight in people, so that ultimately these two help each other. The more insight you get into people, the better the mouse model becomes, the more realistic the mouse model becomes, the more it can be used to 
try to improve uh, our understanding of what's going on in people. Now, clearly, we've got a long way to go, but let me simply end by saying this is, I think, one very productive direction in which we can move, and I think in the years ahead we're likely to make a lot of progress with that. Let me end by thanking the colleagues involved in this. The genetic analysis we carried out, this is Eleanor Simpson, Chris Kellenach, and Ryan Ward, to join us later, were carried out with Conrad Gilliam and Jerry uh, Bruder. The more recent behavioral experiments with Ed Smith and Peter Balsam and their colleagues, and we had the help of Laura Kahn, Tessa hirschfeld stoller Vanessa Renegan, and Jonathan Poland. Thank you very much. Dr. Kandel, thank you very much for this terrific speech. Dear Dennis Kandel, dear presidents of various boards, dear rector, dear deans, dear colleagues, dear senior and junior fellows of the University of Basel, dear guests. The Faculty of Psychology of the University of Basel awards the honor of a Doctor Philosophiae Honor Honoris Causa to Eric Richard Kandel, medical doctor, Kavli Professor of Brain Science, director of the Kavli Institute of Brain Science, co-director of the Mind Brain Behavior Initiative, senior investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Columbia University in New York, USA. First, in acknowledgement of his pioneering and inspiring work linking complex human cognitive functions to molecular processes in simpler organisms. Second, in acknowledgement of his seminal discoveries of synaptic mechanisms underly underlying learning and memory. And third, in acknowledgement of his excellence as a speaker and writer committed to disseminating his knowledge for educational benefit. Let me add a few words about Dr. Eric Richard Kandel. Dr. Kandel was born in 1929 in Vienna, and in 1939 he emigrated to the USA with his family. His academic career began in 1960 at the Harvard Medical School. In 1965, Dr. Kandel moved to New York University, where, as an associate professor, he started his pioneering work on both cellular neurobiology and behavior. Dr. Kandel was recruited to Columbia University in the city of New York in 1974 as founding director of the Center for Neurobiology and Behavior. In 1983, Dr. Kandel became a university professor at Columbia. The following year, he resigned as director of the center to become a senior investigator at the newly formed Howard Hughes Medical Research Institute at Columbia. Dr. Kandel has been awarded the most eminent prizes and awards, including the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine and the Benjamin Franklin Medal for Distinguished Achievement in the Sciences of the American Philosophical Society. Dr. Kandel has authored and co-authored more than 400 scientific articles as well as Principles of Neural Science, the standard textbook in the field and at our university. But there is another side to Eric Kandel that you may not know about. He's an art collector, an historian of early 20th century art in Germany and Austria. And he has said elsewhere that he could have followed the passion as an alternative career path. Dr. Kandel's new popular book, The Age of Insight, we have seen the slide at the very beginning, The Quest of Understand the Con Unconscious in Art, Mind and Brain, takes the reader back to the turn of the century Vienna, the place of his birth, and he writes about the Le Salon there, where artists could mingle with writers physicians and scientists. But this is not just an art history book. Kandel gets deep into the science of the mind, what happens in the brain when we see a beautiful work of art, how it affects our emotions, how we recognize objects and faces too. This is what we miss oftentimes in groundbreaking science, a comprehensive understanding 
of what happens when human beings perceive and interact with objects and subjects and other human beings, written by a marvelous expert in neuroscience. Our faculty is proud to award the pioneer of neuroscience and the lighthouse person who consequentially built bridges in cultural and life sciences, Dr. Kandel, with the 2012 Honorary Doctorate. Dear Professor Kandel, dear colleagues, dear guests, it's now my turn in the name of our university to welcome you and to thank you for being with us and tell you, tell you how very pleased and very honored you are, we are that you are with us today. From the point of view of a university like ours, like University of Basel, that combines a humanistic origin with a recent but all the more effective particular development in natural sciences. In fact, one of most of our students are in natural sciences now, which is a somewhat original situation for a regular Swiss university. There is a sense in which your research, in the way we have heard it in the Laudatio and we have experienced it in, our, in your talk with us, is both very classical and very modern for us. Uh, universities have experienced a form of twofold development or twofold history of teaching and research, and our own university is very much in line with this twofold development. And that is, on the one hand, a gradual specialization of disciplines, an, an ever narrower definition of research topics and of fields in which we teach and we research, but on the other hand, in correlation with it, a little bit like in your mice, in your research, a longing for a kind of unified model of science and research, for values, as it were, or for ideas that are common to any academic activity or endeavor, whether it be in cognitive psychology or in assyriology or in quantum physics. Uh, the, what you have called, in a certain sense, the need for a new synthesis in your own discipline is, in fact, a longing of universities altogether looking for a new synthesis. And in their own institutional strategies, universities right now always try to, to build some kind of an improbable bridge between these two polar trends or opposite tendencies. The more we develop ever more narrow and defined fields of research, the more we also develop our own longing and we favor the, the looking for some kind of globally interpretive models. As far as our own university is concerned in our own recent history, just to take an example, we have tried two possible ways of uh, bridging this gap between an increasing specialization and an increasing longing for common values or common features of research. The first experiment we have uh, had is to try to define two very, very broad and general areas. We call them life sciences and cultural studies, which in fact correspond to the two prototypical approaches to research, if you will, that is the empirical and the and experimental on the one hand and the hermeneutic and interpretative on the other hand. Or, more recently, we have tried to bridge this gap by identifying six more or less well-defined areas from which we expect a particular institutional presence in the scientific community and your own research area is one of these. In this respect, your own research, Professor Kandel, represents for us also not your colleagues in your particular field, but your colleagues as members of peers of the academic community, represents a form of ideal balance of perfectly well-formed bridge for us. A kind, 
listening to you and knowing of your achievements, a kind of humanistically based empiricism or empirically founded humanities, if you allow me the use of these oxymorons. And you show, and showed us even today, indirectly, but not less powerfully, that the so-called two cultures, or three cultures, if we consider social sciences to be located somewhere between humanities and science, correspond to a somewhat old-fashioned, to a standstill, as it were, as you called it, to a very dated understanding of scientific endeavor. For this hope that your research helped us, helps us keep alive in our minds and in our hearts, in our hearts as scholars, as scientists, as students, as administrators, I would like to thank you very warmly in the name of the University of Basel and thanking you in a particular emphasis because beginning with today, our university has the privilege to call you one of us. Thank you very much.